Hello. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Today we are conducting the webinar of the uh, Dr. Rusi Saiwala. Uh, Dr. Rusi Saiwala is a highly experienced clinical physical therapist and trainer, and he has the experience of more than 20 years. He is a creator of the Fit Zone 360 and co founder of the Fit India. He is a founding director of the New York Sports Science Lab. That is a one of kind of a facility in the USA which has conducted the science with technology. Now, Rusi has been trained, uh, training and treating various pro athletic Olympians with all the sports in many years, including the world class boxer, UFC fighters, go golfers, cricketers, tennis players, NBA, NFL players fencers, athletes, swimmers, and ice hockey players, Canada. Uh, he is also registered the practitioner of the USA as well as the Canada. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'll convey to Rusi, sir, to continue the session. Thank you, sir. OK, hi, guys. Uh, this is Rushi. Thanks, Goro, for introduction and introducing me to your college students and all the PT world for the India. So guys, uh, he gave a little background. So I graduated from Baroda from MSU in 2000 and I lived in Toronto for 10 years and I spent 10 years in New York and currently I'm in Texas. Uh, unfortunately, I got a chance to uh, be a director of the big sports company uh, called the New York Sports Science Lab, which was uh, the only kind institute at that time to uh, assess all kind of athletes, a lot of pros in any sports, you name it, uh, and then training them. So I learned right with them. I was a founding director of the lab and it kind of put a very deep foundation of what I am today. So today's session, as uh, Gauro mentioned that we're going to be talking about the rotary cuff dysfunction. Now, the rotary cuff is a big topic. It is impossible for anybody to cover in one hour. So just keep in mind, this is going to be very precise. Uh, just a few approaches and some common use testing we do with that. In order for you to learn more, you have to either take courses or ask your seniors and your tutors and your instructors. Uh, they'll be able to guide you better. I uh, might be launching down the road uh, some webinars and some uh, seminar on the website, which I'm uh, working on right now, which uh, you can log in and learn various stuff in uh, various area. But uh, for now, this is going to be a small introduction. So forgive me if I'm missing anything because I cannot cover anything. Plus, on top of that, this is I'm not uh, educator. So I'm not a professor or teaching colleges and all that. So I'm a hands-on clinician. So I'm going to be straightforward about my findings. So whatever I'm going to show you, a lot of that would be my own experiences. So there are chances, a lot of things I would teach you about the research and there are chances, a lot of things will come out of nowhere. It is just my experience again. So if you have any specific question, please feel free to ask me anytime. You can email me or text me. Uh, Gaurav will provide you all the detail after. So let's just start. And um, I'll uh, give you some more insight about a bunch of other stuff later of what I do and how we can help in making people's life better as a physical therapist. All right, so let's start. All right, so everybody knows that what is rotary cuff. I'm not going to go in detail, neither I'm going to go through origin insertion, nerve supply, everybody knows. So just to give you a little example, not example, the little rundown through that, it's a four major muscle which makes rotary cuff, which everybody knows, but you will be surprised at how many people I interview, the experienced therapists, they don't know all four muscles. You'll be laughing at it, but it is the fact. The, the main reason is when you are working for so many years, you do not call those names too often. A lot of time you just use your layman term with the, talking to the patient or and all that. So those name goes out of the hand. So 
it was funny, but it's a fact that teres minor and subscapularis, a lot of people do not know the name. So if you are a practitioner, do remember your name because it'll come very handy. All right, so uh, supraspinatus again, uh, supplied by suprascapular nerve, C5-6. Infraspinatus, C5-6, again, same nerve. Subscapularis, upper lower subscapular nerve, again, 5-6. And teres minor is axillary nerve. Okay, so nothing new. I'm gonna move forward. Now, the next slide I'm gonna show you, this is very interesting. Everybody knows the anatomy. The first mistake I did is when I joined the college in the first year of college, I was looking at the Gray's anatomy and Grant's anatomy and looking at a nice picture. I see, all right, this is cool. All the muscle are separate. The supraspinatus looks nice, bright and red. Then you look the deltoid, it looks so big and so red and all that. I never thought on my first few months uh, before the dissection started this, those are the illustration clearly. I thought the muscle will be like nicely defined in the, the way it's showing on the anatomy books. And when you start dissecting and you feel like this is not it, this is looks different, but those pictures hard to memorize. So then you realize that, okay, this is just picturization, but now once you graduate, I started taking more courses, I learned more, and then you realize that it is the muscles, regardless of how they look, they are not clearly defined. They are so closely attached to each other that it is sometimes impossible or very, very hard to even do the dissection properly. And the main reason is the fascial chain, which is the next slide is about. If you look at this picture, uh, and I'm guessing you all can see it. Uh, I'm not big tech savvy, so just text me if you're not able to see that. I hope everything is working fine. All right, so if you see the picture on the left, you see the rectus capitis lateralis, this muscle here, and then you see the levator scapulae, okay? So those two muscles are attaching to each other to this area of your scapula, the spine, and it is attaching to the supraspinatus. Ideally, anatomically in any book, you will see there are two separate muscles, but when you're doing your dissection, when you slice through this here, the whole thing comes out as a unit. So what I'm trying to say is, even though it looks separated, they have separate function, they are part of the same channel fascial channel. And that changed my whole perspective of looking at anatomy when I learned all that. So far, in the beginning of my career, when somebody comes with the rotator problem, I was just concentrating on the rotator cuff. I say, yeah, let's do external rotation, let's do internal rotation, let's do some manual therapy to reduce the pain and all that. But when I started learning all of this, I realized that how little I knew at that time. And at that time I thought, hey, I know everything about it. But the more you learn, it opens up more perspective that you know so much little about it. So what I'm trying to say is when you're treating any muscle, always look at the whole chain, whole reaction in there. So one of the example is this, okay? The second example that you see on the picture on the right side, spinal muscles are attached fascially through the rhomboids, and then they are attached to serratus anterior. How many people knew that there is a connection between the rhomboid and serratus anterior? Honestly, I didn't know it for a long time. Plus, uh, just to put some lights in it, the muscle, which is a part of the infraspinatus here, is also attached to this unit. So if you think about this, this Planar muscles through the rhomboid, one part goes to infraspinatus, one part goes to serratus anterior. So the scapula is sitting like a sandwich. Okay. And there are a lot of other fascial chain, but this is for example, one other example is the upper trapezius. So when you're doing the dissection, and if you're going through all the plane properly, when you cut your trapezius muscle, the deltoid and the part of the lateral channel in the arm will come with it. So it looks like a whole long strand. Like starting from your neck all the way to your thumb. You cannot separate 
uh, uh, upper traps with the deltoid to the lateral chains in there. So the whole picture, what do you see in the anatomy book is just for illustration purposes, remember that the body in the real life does not work like that. Everything works in the channel. Our brain is the main control center, but all the muscle also work as a functional unit. So you cannot separate one from the another one. Um, and this is the new fact I learned a few years after I graduated. So I thought it will be important uh, for me to share it for you guys so you learn it. All right, and uh, again, this is biomechanics. I'm not gonna go too much detail. Everybody knows the scapular, shoulder, glenohumeral joint biomechanics. I'm just gonna give little lights on the, how important the part of the AC joint and SEC joint is. So when you're doing the flexion of your shoulder, glenohumeral joint, of course, you're doing the shoulder flexion in there. So 50% movement happen at the glenohumeral joint which is your ball and socket joint. 40% happen at the AC joint, which is huge if you think about it. Uh, when you're doing the range of motion testing, how many people think that the AC joint is that much important in looking at the range of motion? So when you're just doing the ROM, active or passive, you always have to consider all the joint attached to it, your scapular thoracic joints, your AC joint and your SC joint your uh, sternoclavicular and costoclavicular joints. So they all take parts in it. The, we have training system, the ligaments, the muscle, the capsule, everything keeps everything stable. But what I'm trying to say is when people with the rotator cuff dysfunction come to your clinic, and when you see that they are not able to increase, the, uh, they are stuck here or stay there, we always start thinking, hey, maybe there is something frozen shoulder, maybe there is arthritis, maybe, there's something going with the rotator cuff, but it might not be the case. It might be something stuck in the AC joint. Maybe it's not gliding well in any direction. It might be your SC joint that's not gliding well. That is kind of restricting motion and kind of throws you off that something wrong here, but it might be here. So uh, the whole purpose of giving this idea is uh, look everywhere. Don't look just at the problem site. Look away from it. Uh, mainly when it's come to the hip and shoulder joint, they are very complex joint and you cannot differentiate movement from one to other. Um, so AC joint, SC joint and everything dealing with this, very, very important when you are doing the assessment. Um, let's go on the next slide. Okay, a little quiz for you guys. Just thinking in your head, you don't have to answer of course because I cannot see any of you. Uh, what is the most used rotator cuff muscle? And I know what most of people are gonna say. Most of people are gonna say supraspinatus, but it is the wrong answer. The most used rotator cuff muscle is the subscapularis. And I'll explain to you why later on on the state. What is the strongest rotator cuff muscle? Okay, again, the answer is more or less, it's some infraspinatus, but mostly subscapularis. And what is the function of supraspinatus and subscapularis? That's the other question, which is common. Uh, when you are newly good, you would think supraspinatus is on the top of the shoulder. So what it does is does the elevation. Okay, it's fine. Subscapularis is does the internal rotation. Everybody thinks that. Um, when you start seeing a bunch of stuff in the practice, you realize that those are not the main function of it. The supraspinatus is a glider. So basically when you're raising your arm up in the abduction, that muscle and with the other, of course, um, group of muscle, it kind of pushes the head of the humerus down to the head. So you have the clear motion and your head of humerus and tuberosity does not get hit to the subacromial area. Uh, other very, very, very important stabilizer is the subscapularis. It is attached to the front of the shoulder joint and so close to it, it does not have that strong liver arm to do the strong uh, internal rotation as most of people think in the beginning. Of course it does, I'm not saying it doesn't do it, but the main function of it is to stabilize the front of the joint. Uh, our glenohumeral joint, of course, its uh, head is larger in the front side 
So the anterior part of the capsule always have a stress. And in order to withstand this amount of constant force, the subscapularis muscle always have to work harder and hardest. Uh, that's why it's one of the strongest muscle, as well as in a lot of uh, cases, it's an area of dysfunction. So when you're talking about the rotator cuff tear, when you look at the MRIs, you will see the supraspinatus uh, is the number one muscle which get injured in the rotator cuff strain and tear. But the other second major muscle I see all the time on the reports is the subscapularis for obvious reason, because it's a stabilizer. All right, let's go on the next slide. Uh, there are at least 20 to 30 cause I can think of, which can give you the shoulder pain, but I'm just going to go some basic in there. So you get uh, some refresher. Uh, and there are some points very important in that, which I'm going to put some lights on it. So osteomalacia, it's a softening of the bone, bone mineral density, get less vitamin D deficiency using long-term steroid. Uh, the main cause of that, that a uh, lot of time I've seen it, that the uh, shoulder is the major area which shows some dysfunction with that. So a lot of people come with the shoulder pain and then they have weaker bone structure because shoulder and the hips are very highly utilized joints in our body because of the multidirectional uh, motion in that. Um, osteonecrosis of head of humerus is the second point, which is also very common for people who are using the prolonged steroid. Uh, a lot of people, steroid in terms of, uh, sorry, just give me one second, guys. Hello? 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 Guys, can you hear me now? Because I got message that uh, you're not able to hear me properly. Um, I'm gonna. Hello. Hello.
Can you hear me now? Yeah. OK, wonderful. OK, sorry for the little interruption, guys. I didn't realize internet signal is not super cool. OK, so what I was saying is the common causes of the shoulder pain. So the osteonecrosis of hadofumerus is uh, another major cause of the shoulder pain, which I have seen few of them in my career. Um, a lot of people take steroid for different reasons. They have some lung issues. They have some other uh, systemic issue and they have to take steroid. But of course, steroid has a major side effects of making connective tissue, bone and everything weaker, osteoporosis, and then sometimes it also get osteonecrotic too. Um, CRPS, which everybody knows, it has a weird arm pain with uh, different some, uh, sympathetic symptoms and all that. Shoulder pain is again, major complaint. Uh, early frozen shoulder, which even nowadays, it is very hard to differentiate when I see sometime they have all kind of weird symptoms and you see um, they have weird pain, vague pain, movement restriction in the very different areas in there. And it's very, very hard to identify the early frozen shoulder. When it's completely frozen is different. You can check the capsule pattern and all that, but when it's developing, it can easily fool you of rotator cuff tendinitis, which I see all the time. Even the doctors and even the orthopedic, they sometimes miss it when it's acute. So uh, when you see anybody with shoulder pain, think about all those things too. Common reason is osteoarthritis as well. Now, the important things which I was telling you about, referred pain from liver and liver toxicity is one of the major, major, major problem with the, uh, one of the major symptoms is the shoulder pain. Um, most of people don't know about that, but uh, every organ has a connection because embryologically, when those organs are developing and it's coming down in the pathways and settle in their own area, the whole pathway, it can get irritated. Uh, one of the liver, it start moving from top bottom. So one of the major area is this plus, uh, Meridian wise in the Chinese medicine as well as in yoga practice, if you look in detail, there are mind body connection. Every organ has some sort of uh, emotional connection, which I'll show you the slide at the end. But what I'm saying is uh, I have treated tons of shoulder patient not touching the shoulder. I thought it was uh, in the beginning that there was a cup problem, which in the first part of career, I kept on treating, not getting results till I learned the visceral manipulation. That's where I knew that I had to look a lot outside the shoulder area and the scapular area. And uh, chronic pain, one of my patients very recently I treated for six months chronic shoulder pain. MRI was clear with the contrast, without contrast, all the testing were coming negative no sign of cancer, still had chronic pain. All I did is assess his liver, um, it took me 10 minutes and I treated for 15 minutes and 100% better in one session. And that is the liver manipulation I did. So of course there is a, you have to get certified, you have to learn all that, but the visceral manipulation is something you should not neglect. I was very skeptical in the beginning uh, about all working on the organs and how it's gonna affect musculoskeletally, but it works good. So just keep in mind. Uh, hormone imbalance is another major cause because mainly lack of progesterone, mainly in the postmenopausal woman, it affects the myofascial elasticity and the mobility, and it affects uh, the amount of pain. So a lot of time, um, the reason you're getting tear in the later age is common in the female after menopause is because of this uh, hormone imbalances. Um, everybody knows about neural connections. When you have irritated nerve, brachial plexus problem, you can have shoulder pain, of course. And one major important thing which I wanna go through is medication. Cholesterol lowering agent has a major side effect of shoulder pain, which 
which I did not know for many years. Um, there is not tons of research on it, but this is commonly seen in practice. Um, you will be able to find some citation of it too, but uh, that's your research you got to do. Um, another major medication is high blood pressure medication, which probably half of the world are taking it now. It's one of the major side effects is the shoulder pain. Um, anything which lowers your cholesterol have a generalized problem with the muscle pain, but uh, shoulder pain is one of the major area which you see all the time. So keep in the mind. Okay, so let's go through assessment. Um, I won't show you everything, but I'll put some lights on every area so you just understand it better. First of all is the range of motion, which uh, nothing new. All the PT student and experienced PT, they all do it. Active, passive, active assisted, all whatever you need to do. Um, the important part I want to put some lights on is the total range of motion concept, which uh, I learned when I started dealing with the athlete population, uh, a lot of baseball player, cricket players and all that. Um, so what does it tell me more or less when you're checking the internal and external rotation, most of people do in the neutral positions, they do like internal, external, and they just measure the goniometer and just check it down there. Ideal, functionally, it should be done more at the 90 degrees. So you just use external, you check internal, you use the goniometer. Um, in, for a long time, I used to just do two separate things, external I measure and then internal. But when I started seeing a lot of the overhead throwing athlete, whether it's a tennis player or football player or uh, golfers, cricket player, you name it. Uh, when you start seeing that, uh, even the swimmers, um, you will see that they have a lot of anterior shoulder laxity. So you start seeing that a lot of external rotation so they can go all the way there, but they will have very tight internal rotation. And uh, one of the reason, of course, is the overuse of this posterior group of muscles. Uh, when you are seeing the range of motion, you always miss the picture. So what they, in the sports world, what they're doing is they're doing more total range of motion concepts. So they are combining external rotation with the internal rotation. So whatever the degree that comes in, they put that number on there and they, they compare with their non-dominant side that's what gives them clear picture of it. Because sometimes it is okay to have that anterior laxity, mainly if you are a baseball player and if you're constantly throwing the ball like this and twisted motion, you are going to have that. It's not if and but, it's just a matter of time. Uh, and sometimes it is okay. So total range of motion, internal and external both is equally important. Um, Strength testing, sorry guys, one second. Uh, okay, strength testing for internal rotator and external rotator, again, it's a common practice, which everybody knows it, so I'm not gonna go detail. The important things I wanna mention is the isokinetic. Um, don't think as far as I knew that they have the isokinetic testing device in a lot of colleges yet. A lot of research facility has it and the big institute in US and all the other countries have that. Uh, basically what it does, it uh, measure how much strength you can create. So they control the resistance going and suppose internal external rotation of the shoulder and they go at the various speeds. So it goes at, and common practice is 90, 180, and 360 degrees. So you are moving your shoulder in different area, a uh, different speed, but the machine will not let you force the movement. It'll control your motion isokinetically. Um, the best practice for that is we measure in the neutral as well as the functional practices. We measure in the 90 degrees of angle in both and they kind of control it and they want to see that how much force you're able to create and you will see all the graphs and all. It's a lot of detail. So uh, please check your YouTube videos. I'm sure you will get something in there. 
posture and breathing very very important topic in the shoulder when you're assessing anybody with this rotor cuff problem um, sorry guys i'm clicking wrong okay so just to give you a little quick example um, as you know that the shoulder blade motion has to do a lot with your how your thoracic uh, positioning is um, just watch me okay and people who are new or new grad they have to see this people who are experienced they all know about it but okay i'm sitting straight right now and just watch my shoulder going okay it's kind of nice and easy i have no problem at all now watch me when i'm slouching okay i'm in IT and I'm spending my most of days in or in the computer um, or I'm just sitting like this all day okay or so what's gonna happen is I'm slouching I'm kyphotic now my shoulder blade position scapular I'm sorry I use a lot of layman term for patient so it comes automatically now watch this and I'm not exaggerating this is all I'm gonna go I cannot go one knee, which I can go now, but now the minute I'm sitting, I can go up to here. And why is that? Of course, you're impinging your head of humerus in the subacromial area. Changing your biomechanics is gonna change the whole picture. So when you are doing the assessment, do not neglect your posture. Again, um, it's a lot of detail to go to for breathing, but breathing has a lot to do with how your shoulder and your um, rotor cuff is gonna behave as well. Most of people do not use, according to the research, the right side of the lung area. They have a pattern uh, and the pattern is more like this. So I'm exaggerating it, but try to get, understand my point. So this is the pattern. So they are underutilizing this area and overutilizing this part their whole structure changes from the toes to your neck to the shoulders. And how is it gonna affect your shoulders? Imagine you are not using too much of this lung and your muscles start getting guarding, tightening, is gonna affect the whole biomechanics for obvious reason because of the connection of all the fascia and the viscera and all that stuff in there. So um, it's not the breathing rate I'm talking about, it's the type of breathing, uh, whether it's a diaphragmatic or uh, upper raspy or the lower abdominal and how all the muscle are tight or weak. There is a whole, it's called postural restoration technique. Um, again, it's a big topic, I cannot touch all that. Uh, the other, of course, Testing I do is orthopedic testing I do for all the rotary cuff, which I'll go on my next slide. Um, MRI x-rays, which will give you detail insight. Um, fascial palpation is something I unfortunately won't be able to show you too much here, but I will touch base with it so you guys understand how does it affect. Uh, T-band reciprocal inhibition, which if I remember correctly, I used to do it all the time when I graduated and when I started trading patient, I didn't know much about the testing. <coughs> the great book of McGee and the Kistner, uh, which I use for my licensing, it wasn't there at that time, or maybe I wasn't aware. So all I knew is a couple of tests from the college and I just found out that, okay, reciprocal inhibition, so if you are hurting somewhere, you just contract the opposite group of muscle that kind of relaxes. So that's my old school technique, but I still some time to confirm that I do that. So basically what I do is if I feel like somebody has trouble raising the arm up, I put the TheraBand attached to somewhere hook and I try to pull it down. And when I pull it down, it kind of inhibit the supraspinatus. So a lot of time what I see after doing five, 10 times, I go arm up and you say like, hey, I'm feeling better. Then it kind of confirms my, in my head diagnosis that, okay, they might have something going on with the rotary cuff. But again, it's not validated or proof. This is my own technique. So don't go looking for it. You might not find anything on it. Um, other, practice is the test I do is the posterior gliding. So 
of course, you have to check the position of the head of humerus in the glenoid fossa. And a lot of time you will see is the head of humerus is kind of shifted anteriorly and being it's a more lax structure in the front of the shoulder. So what you do is you take the mobilization belt, which I'm sure every PT in the wall has it. And I'm just gonna show you in the sitting. So you try your shoulder reduction first and you say, okay, I have a pain here, I cannot go further. And physically I see that the head of humerus is kind of shifted forward. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the belt. I'm gonna stick it right now under my butt and I'm going to pull this. So the belt is pulling posterior and downward. And now I'm going to raise it and I wanna see if that is helping or not. If that is helping, that kind of confirms that, oh, maybe the shoulder either is not stable or the rotor cuff is weak enough to keep it there. So what is the use of this is my taping. So if this is working, then I'm going to start taping them with the posterior gliding. So it is important to us to know, uh, very easy to implement and you can use for diagnosis as well as for treatment. Okay, now the important part is the testing. It took me a while to learn. Uh, when I graduated from college, I just knew one or two tests of supraspinatus. I have to do the manual muscle testing, that's about it. When I read uh, the book, McGee, Kistner, Sullivan, all those and the other bunch of other two courses. Then I learned a bunch of other testing. Now, the, my problem is when I read something, I have to read every single word, every single alphabet in that. Uh, I remember when I was preparing for my license exam in Canada, I read at least hundreds of tests for each joint, not hundreds, but each joint had tons of tests. And the main confusion came in was which one to apply in the real practical scenario. Okay, uh, small example, when you're doing the trading and you, if you know how to do the stock trading, you learn the technical analysis and there are so many technical indicators. So when I started doing that, I know so many of that, I didn't know which one to use when the time come to do the stock trading. So same thing. What my whole meaning of saying this is when I started learning all, I got more confused because I didn't know they're testing. One time I use one test, second time I use the other test and I was getting confused. And then I realized that confusion was not only mine, there was a bunch of people who were going through the same confusion. So I was glad to learn afterward. It's something called a cluster testing, which uh, it means the one test sometimes is not enough. Some tests are more specific, some tests are more sensitive. And when you use those tests as a cluster uh, with the, that increase your specificity, specificity sensitivity ratio. And that is more accurately able to help you to diagnose um, and it'll be very useful in treatment. So one of the cluster testing for rotor cuff tear is this, as you can see on the screen, a common sign is the drop palm sign. So basically you try to raise your arm up and you try to lower it and you cannot control it because your rotor cuff is torn. Uh, painful arc sign is uh, when you're raising your arm in the scapular plane or abduction, uh, you will have painful arc in the mid range from here to there, more or less 60 to 120. And then spinner, it is muscle testing, which is of course the external rotator of the shoulder. So when you try to, compare on the both side, um, you'll see the weakness on one side versus the other side. So that's one of the tests. So when, if all those three tests are positive, the probability of patient having the full thickness tear is 91% as per park, which is pretty high. There is not single test which can accurately diagnose. So we have to use the cluster. So do keep in the mind that the cluster test exists for a bunch of joints and muscles. So do research for that. Um, common again, cluster for the subacromial impingement sign. 
uh, positive Hawkins candidate test, painful arc sign, and first panatus test. Uh, negative likely, um, positive likelihood ratio is 10.6 if all three are positive. It, 95% probability of having the impingement. Um, again, there's a lot of detail. I won't go through that. This is just for you to do more research on your side. Um, the common other test, uh, supraspinatus empty can test and champagne toast test, which is again, isometrically is just checking, contracting the muscle to see if you have pain or not. Okay, the major, major issue with this shoulder problem is the trigger points, which I guarantee you bunch of therapists are neglecting it still nowadays. There is a valid data, but at the same time, there is a debunk about this too, about travel and all that, that okay, those trigger points are blah, 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 and all that. So. I never take research too seriously. I learn what the research say, but then I apply um, what I had to. Uh, Sometimes the research say doesn't, don't do that. I still do it because my patients likes it. So use your own met, uh, judgment on that. Uh, if you look at all those area on the pictures, you will see this is a referred pain pattern for different group of muscle in the shoulder. If you see the pecs minor, so a lot of time they have tenderness here, and you see the pain goes down all the way to the middle two fingers, uh, last two fingers. Okay, now let me show you other picture. Let's torsi. Look at this, it start here, and that also goes down in there. Okay. Um, when you see this kind of pain pattern on somebody that they are having finger uh, pain in this too, what do you think of? You will think of most likely they have a learner problem or something, but always look for the trigger points. Um, I have treated tons of clients, mainly the fighters and the boxers. They get better in 10 minutes of trigger point therapy. You can use your hands on treatment or you can do the dry needling if you are, uh, know how to do it. Um, this is one way of doing. So supraspinatus again has a referred pain pattern. It goes down all the way. So a lot of time they say, oh, I'm having arm pain. So do keep in the mind the dermatome, myotomes, all that C5, 6. Again, it can refer the pain down there. Uh, you should, as a clinician, keep the chart of the trigger points in uh, your clinic. So you can constantly see and correlate the pain pattern, which your patient is saying with this pictures and work on that. Very, very effective. Sometimes just five minutes of treatment can take them out of misery. They are suffering for a long time. All right, the fun fact and the functional testing. Um, I, I just briefly talk about the isokinetic strength testing to you guys uh, a few minutes ago. Um, and I also mentioned that we check if clinical setting at the different um, angle. So we go in the neutral, we go at the different speed, 90, 180, 360, we go at 45, and then we go at the 90, which is the most functional for overhead athlete. What you see typically when you're doing the testing is there is a difference between the external rotator and internal rotators strength-wise, and that is usually 66%. Uh, when you have rotor cuff problem, this ratio changes drastically. Um, and one of the main thing we check in or the athlete is external rotation with the eccentric control and internal rotation with the concentric control. Because when you are or an athlete, you need that constant deceleration and the, your back muscle external rotator group works a lot harder. So they have to have good eccentric control. So again, it's a lot of learning and isokinetic testing. So I won't go through detail, but just educate yourself about it. <coughs> okay, the important part of our seminar is probably everybody's waiting for. Um, let's see what time, so I know, okay. So 
I will touch base with all the techniques a little bit in detail, but I cannot go through it because each technique itself is a couple of days course. Um, I have learned all that and I have taught in parallel at uh, Baroda as well in the past and uh, hopefully next year or this year, if things gets better, I'll start coming more to teach more stuff. Uh, so watch for that. Uh, well, for now, I'll just give you a little idea. So the number one treatment, which is not number one, but one of the method is if somebody is going with the shoulder pain, um, do they get any better with the manipulation or not? So there is a cluster test for it. Uh, and it's called the clinician clinical prediction rule, um, CPR. So do search for it in the Google. You will see tons of topic in there. There are clinician clinical prediction rule for diagnosis, a lot of stuff, as well as for treatment. So this is one of the rule. So if your pain free shoulder flexion is less than 127, uh, shoulder internal rotation is less than 53 at 90 degree of abduction, negative nearest test, um, you're not taking medication for the shoulder pain and symptom are acute subacute, so less than 90 days old, then the success rate of uh, cervical thoracic manipulation in treating the shoulder pain is 100%. So as I said, like posture affects your shoulder pain. So when you are running through the bad posture, sometime just doing the one manipulation or two, if you're following all those criteria, it can take care of your shoulder problem. You might not even have to cuff dysfunction as a lot of time you think. Sometimes it is just and you just have to follow this rule in there. And it's very, very accurate and effective. I have tried it multiple times in my clinical setting and I found it's very useful. Again, you have to learn how to do CT manipulation, which is not in scope right now. Okay. Um, let's start soft tissue mobilization, myofascial release and some induction technique. And then um, we'll talk about some other stuff in there quickly. Okay, now, um, supraspinatus muscle, right? So if you remember in the second slide, I said the supraspinatus is connected with your levator scapulae fascially, and then it is attached to the tuberosity here. Uh, the supraspinatus is it runs through this tunnel here. When you are experienced clinician, you will be able to palpate that easier, but when you are new, it'll take some time for you to learn it. It took me a lot longer to learn all this thing, but your hands-on skill is very important. Uh, I've seen a lot of clinician wear gloves all the time. And to be honest, as far as hygiene concern, it's okay to wear that, but you will not be able to palpate clearly. My strong suggestion, just wash your hand but do the palpation properly. So the first thing you have to do is you have to palpate the belly of the supraspinatus behind the spine and here. And when you are putting your hands on the belly of the supraspinatus and you're going side to side, front and back, and you're comparing on the both side, just try randomly, it to your family and all that stuff. You will see if your dominant side on like suppose right side, versus the left side, you will see some difference. You feel like your muscle are hypertrophy or tense. Um, the upper traps is the major muscle which is covering it here. So you have to go at the depth. So when you put your hand in there, you just apply a little depth. So you have to press it, okay? And then you just slowly, you just move side to side, front and back. And close your eyes, feel it, you have to feel the movement. Unfortunately, I cannot show on the screen. If I'm doing the practical course, I usually make every my student make them feel it so they understand the difference. Uh, connect right and left side and you will know some difference. Now, the very important thing you have to remember that when this muscle goes to attach an insertion area, it goes through the tunnel under subacromial area, which is very common site of restriction for 
the fascial area in there for the supraspinatus. So when you diagnose a supraspinatus dysfunction or tear, um, you always have to palpate that area. So the way to do it is, and I'm sorry, unfortunately, guys, this is midnight here in US, so I don't have any demo person. Otherwise, I would have kept it in here, but I'm just going to show it on my shoulder. So this is the AC joint. I'm going to go behind. So I'm, my shoulder is rested. I'm going to use my thumb or finger right now, and I'm just going to go through the tunnel. So I was trying to go inside there. In a lot of P time, you'll feel like you will not be able to pass your hand through it or finger through it just because it's so much fascially tense. So the treatment method for both of them, I'm gonna show you in one second. Other common area of palpation is the insertion point here, the tubercle area. And a lot of time, this area will be tender, mainly if you have any kind of partial rotor cuff tear, you'll always find it's tender around here, this area. Okay, now there are different techniques for different area of the treatment. So let me just start in the muscle belly of the supraspinatus. It's a myofascial, the first one you see here, that's what I use. I use my thumb, okay? I'm gonna put right in there. And it is hard for you to imagine, but imagine I'm just laying down, okay? And my therapist is putting the finger in there. What you have to do is passively hold the arm and try to move forward very slowly. So what you're doing is trying to elongate the whole area in there. Okay, so I'm pressing my thumb down and I'm going to just move forward and backward. And this is, again, I'm exaggerating the speed of it. You have to do it very slowly. And a lot of time you'll feel it as if you keep doing it for a couple of minutes, you will start seeing some structural changes around your thumb. Uh, you will start feeling the warm. You will get a little moisture in the hand. You feel like your muscle are letting it go. But that would happen only if they have restriction. So the palpation skill is the must. For the technique to see under the tunnel here, you put your thumb, you palpate between your spine and the clavicle, you try to go underneath the tunnel. So when I'm sitting, I'm gonna do one way. So watch me here, okay? So I'm pressing it down. Now I'm going to press my elbow down on the chair and I'm relaxing it. So this is the cell technique. Okay, so what I'm doing is inferiorly gliding the head of humerus. Just imagine this, because that supraspinatus is attached on the top here, just like that. So when you are gliding inferiorly while you're pressing down at one end, that'll help to glide this easier. And you will be able to get restrictions so, uh, release uh, very quickly within a couple of minutes. So this is one of the technique area under that. Uh, the third one cause common point is this. A lot and lot of tear patient, they will have this. I do not use my fascia release because it's a tendon area. So what I do is um, induction technique or positional release technique. So I'm just gonna show you one technique on that. So suppose you have pain here, seven out of 10, okay? You know the tendon, what supraspinatus does. Does a little bit rotation and downward, so it's kind of stabilizing, right? So what you do is you keep pressing the point, you take the shoulder passively again, therapist is doing it, and little abduction position or scapular plane. And you see as the patient is, is your pain drop? I say, all right, from five, now I'm feeling pain three. So, okay, let's do a little bit rotation and see if the pain drops again. I say, yes, I'm feeling two out of 10. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna hold that position, anything less than three. And I'm just gonna keep on holding it till I feel some structural changes. As I said, not structural. 
physical changes, physiological changes. Your muscle, the tendon will start loosening up. You might feel a little pulsation. You might feel sweating. And uh, by the time you finish this in two or three minutes, you'd gradually bring them down to the position and you test it. You say, okay, how much pain you have now? And say, all right, I have three. So five minutes ago, they had five. Now they have three, which is good. Again, this is temporary technique. is one of the osteopathic technique called induction or the position of release. Uh, once you release the tension, it kind of buys you the time to do other strengthening. So you know that when you have tear or sprain in, or strain in the rotary cuff, ultimately you have to correct your posture. You have to start working on strength training. But if you're in pain, you will not be able to function it. So what you're gonna do is do all this manual therapy method to reduce the pain, and then you still have to do strengthening. So do not neglect that. People who say that they are a manual therapist and that's all they do, they are highly unsuccessful here. I've seen tons. Um, I started like that in the beginning. I wasn't giving attention to the exercise. I say, hey, I learned all those techniques. This is cool. It works. But then I see the people repeat. So then you learn that this is not all. This is a part of your tool. You still have to do the other stuff. Okay. Um, Looking again, I'm still working on this areas. Myofascial soft tissue release. The other technique for infraspinatus. You know, the infraspinatus does the external rotation. So you go and palpate the belly of the infraspinatus. A lot of time you'll see the trigger points. So if it is a trigger point set up in there, you do the trigger point release, which is almost like induction technique which find the more sore point and you just hold it and uh, put your muscle in the relaxed position and see the thing changes. A lot of time, if it's a small trigger point, it gets better with the hands on. A lot of time what I've seen is you need some dry needling or something which goes deeper. The main reason is uh, shoulder is complex and a lot of muscle structure are deeper. And when you are overusing your upper traps and delts all the time from slouching or lifting and all that stuff, it is very hard to reach to the depth. If you're an experienced clinician, you will be able to reach to the depth. Otherwise, try needling is the best approach. Um, okay, so one of the techniques I'll show you is the infraspinatus. So, I have a soreness here. I was just doing some push-ups here. So I have tender point here, so eight out of 10. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep pressing. I could go on the sideline and I'm gonna ask my therapist to passively move the shoulder in the upper position, okay? While I am pressing on this area of the trigger point, it is the one of the soft tissue release, or if you're doing actively, there is also active release technique, ART, which is common in chiropractic world in the US. So I'm pressing and I'm slowly going up and down, and I'm gonna do that for at least 10 to 15 reps. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not that flexible. Um, so what I have to say is when you are doing any kind of treatment, whether it's a soft tissue or myofascial, always think three-dimensional. Our body does not function in one dimension. You releasing this is good, but then you try to move around a bit and try to see if that is helping you or not. Okay. Um, other important thing I have to mention here is if you remember the connection between the levator and the supraspinatus. So when you're working on the supraspinatus tendon, whether you're doing myofascial or soft tissue work, do not neglect the levator. A lot of time the levator are hypertense, overused from all the bad posturing and all that. Treating only supraspinatus, it'll never give you the full results. So work on this area to do your soft tissue work, stretching, strengthening, whichever you're training, but do not neglect that. Okay, the manipulation part, 
which I explained here. Um, cervical thoracic manipulation, if you're following on all this criteria, it helps to a great deal. Sometimes doing the rib cage technique and thoracic manipulation also works great. Um, it all depends on the experience and the finding. I cannot emphasize more in dry needling and acupuncture uh, because it is very useful clinically. I use it all the time and it's very successful. The only problem in US, they don't pay for it, uh, the insurance company. So it is sometimes hard to convince patient to pay for it, but in India, it might be a different story. Uh, if you're charging for it and they're ready for it, go and learn it and start using it because it is very effective and the right people. Um, another common technique I use, Graston or IESTM, Instrument Assisted Soft Tissue Mobilization. This one is given by Jatin. So if you're listening to that, thanks for giving this. Um, this he made the tool, he's in Surat. Um, so there are if people who are not familiar with it. It's kind of basic metal tool. The person who invented it, he had no therapy background. He just was working out at the gym and he just, somebody was hurting. He started working on it and he felt better the person. So he just did more research and he found out this kind of tool is very useful. It is used by old Indians many, many thousands years ago. It is used by Chinese called Gua Sha techniques. So it is used by the Greeks. So it is nothing new. They were using different things before. They were using either a stone or horn or buffalo and other stuff in there um, to release the fascial tension or muscle tension and all that stuff. Now we are using the steel tools. So and just to give you a little example, if you are suffering from a lot of rotor cuff and if you don't know the palpation scale, the one at least the basic things you can do is use the tool. And um, again, I will not show you the technique, you gotta learn it. But uh, one way of applying is go on the bare skin and you can just start working on it, fascial fanning, it's called. And that kind of um, our skin has a lot of receptors. So sometimes the rubbing on it, or doing the skin rolling, it will relax the deep internal tension. Have you, if you're a clinician, have you seen that sometimes people come with the pain, all you do is just uh, hold it like this and all of a sudden they feel better. So psychosomatic issue is also has to be considered at the same time, our skin is highly, highly have a lot of receptors. Do not forget that uh, you do not go to go deep in any kind of techniques which a lot of people think they have, they have to crank, they yank them out, and they has to feel pain in order to get better. It's not a fact. Uh, when you're looking at um, osteopathic techniques, most of the techniques are very gentle. Whether you look at the induction, or you look at the muscle energy, or you look at the visceral manipulation, skin rolling, craniosacral therapy, and all the myofascial release, this all are osteopathic techniques. Um, it's very gentle form chiropractor, which I, my whole life I work with them, they go more aggressive and they do joint manipulation as grade four, five and all that. Um, as a physical therapy, we fall in between. So sometimes you use gentle techniques, sometimes you do hard techniques. So select your client, know them well before you decide what kind of treatment approach you want to do it. Um, Neural technique, they, it's a lot of detail. I cannot go through uh, much in there right now, but basically a lot of time I've seen when you have constant shoulder pain and you think that's a rotor cuff dysfunction, doing the proper stretching of the brachial plexus, the nerve flossing and all that stuff, that will release tons of tension in there. And there is a manual technique around the brachial plexus, the median nerve, ulnar nerve as well, which, uh, Again, is a course and you have to learn. Um, you're just basically releasing the fascial tension which around the neural sheath and that takes care of a lot of pain in there. Um, skin rolling technique, which is most of people probably not aware of it. It's not super popular either. 
um, basically what they do as i told you before that uh, skin has a lot of receptors and that has direct impact on how the muscle underneath gonna behave so a lot of time the skin rolling technique is you hold the skin, you roll, there is a technique, but you roll in the certain direction and you just hold the skin. You don't even go on the muscle level. And that kind of let go all the muscle because of all the neural supply, it goes from the skin to the muscle and releasing this, it helps tremendously. So one of the way I do it a lot of time, even if you don't know the technique, you can try it, nothing to lose. Uh, use your two fingers, hold, the skin on top of your supraspinatus tendon. You gently squeeze it and you kind of roll it, roll anteriorly. So watch this here. Um, I'm going to push and I'm going to roll this. And I'm just going to stay here. And when I stay there in like two, three, four minutes, sometime what I'll feel is underneath muscle automatically start reducing in the tension. Again, this is not the way properly done. Usually I stabilize this head, stabilize neck, and I stretch, and then I do the rolling. But uh, do keep in the mind, it's called skin rolling. Um, craniosacral therapy, um, again, not super popular. Some research done, they find effective. It's common with people with head injuries and um, some kind of uh, weird issue when they have chronic pain, headaches and all that stuff is very effective. But at the same time, I've seen a lot of shoulder people do respond well um, because they basically try to balance the flow of the CSF between the head and sacrum. I do not do that because I still don't believe a lot of stuff they do, but doesn't mean it's wrong. I've seen people get better because one of my massage therapists do that. And I've seen a lot of people come happy after treatment. So I'm not completely negating it, but I'm not a big fan of it. So not using it. Visceral manipulation, my favorite topic, uh, which I can keep talking about it all day. Um, I briefly mentioned in the beginning that visceral manipulation can really be helpful and a lot of time working on the liver, it can take care of the shoulder problem, which a lot of time people think that it's just a rotator cuff issue or the arthritis or labrum issue. Um, there is a diagnosis method, but one of the treatment method is you basically making the patient sits and you come behind them. And I'm just gonna show you underneath. Um, you put your fingers, the padding of the fingers, Okay, you put it under the liver. Now, keep in mind that liver is the largest organ of our body. It's the heaviest. It does a lot of cleaning in our body. So a lot of toxic substance which we create, whether you're drinking or you're taking a lot of medication, everything gets collected here. And then we have the bile and the hepatics and all that stuff, the gallbladder. Um, the liver has a straight connection. If you see the next slide, is this, uh, if you have seen the Inside Out movie, you will see the anger weakens the liver. So people who have tendency to get constantly angry, their liver weak, uh, they get weak liver. Fear hurts the kidneys. Stress weakens the brain and the heart. Anxiety hurts your lungs and worry affects your stomach. It is very straight body-mind connection. So liver is the root for anger and frustration. So people who have tendency, <coughs> I've seen this in a lot of CEOs and the hedge fund dealers, the stock traders, they have so much anger, frustration, their liver always gets stuck in certain fascial plane. And then they come with the shoulder pain. And when I know what the profession is and what kind of stress they are in or anger they are, I don't even do too much assessment in the neck and shoulder, I straight go on the liver. And most of the time I find something in there. So just to give you a little explanation, just the way our physiologically our body moves, front, back, side, like the shoulder joint, right? Our liver has physiological motion. It uh, moves front and back. It moves tilt side to side and it rotates around the axis as well. 
the movement is so tiny that you cannot feel it unless if you are super experienced in that. It's very, very tiny. Your mind has to be there to feel it. For a long time, I thought it was all humbug when they were teaching me. I took course after course. I spent tons of money. Even to my last course, I was thinking I was stupidest person on planet to take this course and go from my beautiful PT practice to go on this kind of visceral manipulation. But when you start learning stuff, when you start seeing the changes, then you believe it. Then you a lot of research coming out at the top hospital in UK and all that, and their finding is very effective. But what I'm trying to say is the liver manipulation. So let me just show you the technique instead of just talking. So one of the ways, so imagine I'm the therapist hand and I'm coming from behind. I'm just going to use my top tip of the finger. I'm going to hold my liver in my hand. Okay, and I'm going to ask the patient to lean forward a little bit. So basically, his whole liver is in my fingertip, not top. It's more like a padding of it. And I'm going to stay there. What I will feel after a while is the liver start moving. It will feel like it's floating. It's almost like the paper boat floating on the water and the staying. It just feels like it's going everywhere and then it reaches the calmness. And then you'll feel as your fingers can go deeper and deeper in there. And then your liver eventually, if you know how to do it, balances out. And immediate results you will see, you ask them to raise shoulder up and if you feel like, shit, this is good. I feel a lot better. I didn't touch the shoulder. I just worked on the liver because it was fascially, everything was restricting. Emotion, medication, alcohol, everything traumatized the liver. So watch for it. This is one of the example. Then again, uh, even the spleen, your heart, your lungs, everything affects your shoulder as well. So you have to know what you're doing, but this is one of the way I think it's useful. Um, uh, now I'm just gonna quickly talk about some exercises, which I'm sure you everybody knows it, but there are certain things um, I don't know how many people in India are using. So I want to just put some lights on it. So kinesio taping, I think is getting popular now, but one of the method of stabilizing or mobilizing or activating is the, uh, you tape in the different areas. Uh, just gonna take some courses to learn proper about it. One of the most common things I use for shoulder uh, rotor cuff problem is the body blade. This thing, it moves it, okay? So one of the training I do with this is when your pain start getting better, put them in a different direction and keep moving this. You can change the angle. You see what uh, I'm doing? So basically they'll help uh, to improve Rishi, your- Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. Can you uh, off your uh, share screen so people can uh, view your uh, videos and all. Turn off your share screen. If PPT is over, just uh, turn off your uh, share screen. So PPT can, uh, people can have a full view, uh, view of yours with uh, exercise and all. Okay, hold on. Turn off my share screen, you said, right? Yeah, so yeah, so it can be minimized. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can you see me now? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, wonderful. Okay. So again, what I was showing is, oh, I'm holding upside down, the body blade, okay? So as I said, like I do a lot of endurance training with the shoulder problem. Um, so you go on different angle, you can go on functional angles in there and I'm just moving it. Okay, a lot of people, they just love it. They keep doing, they want to keep doing it. Um, it's the easiest thing. It is very old method. There's nothing new with this, but it is useful. I use it all the time. Okay, um, one of the method. One of the other main things I do in my manual therapy is the cupping, uh, which I didn't talk much about, but the cupping in simple principle, 
it was used with the acupuncture meridians but i just don't go straight by that i what i do is basically this is a silicone cup you put in the areas where you have problem and basically lifts you just imagine this is kind of pulling it right so it kind of lifting you so i do a lot of functional method with that so when i'm doing this i do a lot of other manual therapy technique with this. So that is very, very useful. So one of the way for the rotary cuff, I put in the belly and you just take the air out, you squeeze it and then you let go. You can use the glass cup as well. Uh, there are a lot of method. Uh, I think Jatin teaches as well. So you can talk to him to learn more about it. So you can just do some cupping when you are doing some other techniques. Um, Again, very useful for any problems. It doesn't have to be only rotary cuff. Graston, I talked about. Joint mobilization for the needed patient, as I said in the assessment part, that if your shoulder is more like an anterior position, use this technique and then you can tape it using the different method. One of the dumbbell I have is like squeezy dumbbell, which a lot of female uh, people here, I mean, a lot of female athletes likes to do that instead of that body blade. So basically it's almost like that, it kind of shakes. Okay, so I use this a lot of time for my patients for endurance training as well, as you can see. Then I go in different angle, different direction. All right. The old TheraBand, everybody knows about. Every single one of us probably do the external rotation, shoulder, and it keeps on yanking and yanking when you have shoulder problem. How many people do really give attention to what you're doing with that? Um, do you really think your shoulder muscle is weak or the problem somewhere else? You gotta think about it. Do not just keep yanking on the TheraBand and keep doing the stuff, which everybody loves doing that. There is one proper way of doing it, which I'm gonna show you now, okay? See, this is a small pillow, or you can use anything you have. This is my loop band. So when you're doing this rotary cuff, you hold the pillow underneath. I'm making sure I'm not hiking, and I'm doing this. Okay, why do I keep the pillow or any kind of rolls underneath? Any ideas? Okay. Now, when you are just doing this, you're applying a lot of compressive forces and always remember that when you do the tug of war, always the strongest one, it always pulls more. So in our rotor cuff case, what do you think who does the external rotation? The rotor cuff are tiny muscles and compared to the deltoid and uh, packs and other stuff in there. So when you're doing this internal rotation, your packs and delts are taking over. When you're doing the external rotation, a lot of activity is done by the packs and middle traps and rhomboids and all that stuff in there. What I'm trying to say is when you're using this pillow like this or any kind of roll, basically put those bigger muscle at a little bit mechanical disadvantage and you can concentrate more on the rotary cuff part. There is no way to isolate that. There is not research on that. They're okay doing this. Very theoretical, but I've seen it's work very well for people who can get better by doing the proper technique. So this is the proper technique of doing that. So do start implementing that in your routine. Um, other stuff, I'm just going to show you a little bit. Okay, as you can see, the closed chain activity is equal to any kind of outer cup problems in there. So a lot of people just be yanking. Do keep in mind you have to attach the ball. I'm pushing my shoulder blade backwards, so I'm completely protracting step 
and I'm going to do any kind of ball you can use. You can use ball, football, whatever you have it at there. And you can do different alphabets. And the main thing you keep in mind is don't go like this and do this. It will come really for you off your shoulder blade, really be nice and firm. You're working on the scapula thing. That's what it is for. Um, you have a chance at the beginning, the cup was painful. You might not be able to do it. This is the latest exercise. Okay. Um, another common exercise I do is the slide. I don't know if you can get it on. Yes, I can. I think it's okay. Basically, going here. Again, I'm protecting it. And I'm going in different directions. Okay, this is all the Kambali exercise. Okay, so imagine you're doing the Adupota on the floor and all that. So they have really strong uh, scalp muscles. So very important do anything you have, use the nice floor and a smooth floor is you can use the towel if you have it or use the slider you can buy it from anywhere. Okay. So that's about it I think in terms of the rotor cuff. There is a lot more to talk about, but uh, I cannot do this in that short amount of time. Again I can work on three, four days course when I come next time. And if you have any question, by all means ask, but this is just to give you a little glimpse of it, what can be done. There are lots of manual therapy, osteopathic techniques, but you cannot just use that. Use this with your knowledge, with all the proper history taking um, and all the exercises appropriately with it. Um, so I'm gonna, stop for the rotary cup, but let me give you a little idea about my website, um, which is going to be functioning soon. It's not done yet. Um, it is going to be live. It is on right now, but it has a lot of modification it needs. Um, slide. Okay, can you see this, Karo? Yes, sir. Okay, so it is called the fitzone360.com. I will try to see if that works. Basically, I created this website by keeping in mind that a lot of time I see that mainly for athletes that was created, but anybody can use this, all the universities and all that too. A lot of time I don't see any proper testing done in proper way for a lot of athletes. So suppose you're a cricket player, right? Just to give you a little example. And you want to know, you have like 10 people to select and uh, I mean, and you have 100 applicants, you don't know which one is good. So a lot of time you just look at how good they are taking on um, hitting the run or doing the wickets. But uh, when you go in different sports, you start realizing that just a technique uh, is not enough. You have to know what are their mechanics, what are the injury rate, how good they are in a lot of testing. Um, so if you, anybody is interested in football, we just had a draft here yesterday and they picked the top player in different teams and all that. So what they do is they go through vigorous testing. And uh, basically I created this, this website for India for now, uh, which does very detailed testing of all these different sports uh, used by all the top uh, countries. So just for ex an example, for cricket, how do you know, is it physically is fit to play cricket or not? So we do the testing for their speed, their agility, their flexibility, their strength, their balance, their vision. Uh, so everything is done on this website. You will not be able to see it. You have to log in as an institute. You see a bunch of detail, but just to give you an example, this is how it looks internally. This is inside view. Um, so if you see on the right side of the panel, you see the ankle mobility, FMS, bi-balance, vision, I'm sorry. 
sports specific testing and all that stuff. So what happens is this score here, that kind of tells you your risk level and then a different testing shows different thing in there. And you can save this data and you can reuse this. So it is excellent, excellent as one of a kind uh, thing I created and working for past few months on this project. But uh, when it's properly launched, I'll give you a little demo all with Govro and all that. And so you can learn proper. But in the meantime, you can check the website out just to give an idea of my background and all that stuff. Anybody wants to keep seeing some videos, which I keep on posting on and off uh, about different techniques and, and all that, uh, you can add me in what's called orthopt.rushi. Again, sorry. Um, I'm also starting this website soon, Cosmos Rehab, um, just for training purposes and other stuff too. And, and this is again, I like I own this uh, gym guys. I provide uh, personal training um, to the different people in the house and all that stuff. Uh, so this is basically where I am. Um, you will be able to see in Fit Zone about all the, not all, but a bunch of people I have treated in the past as well, and my detailed background. So this is about it. Um, if anybody has any question, please reach out to me, as I said, and uh, or reach out to Gauro and he will help you out with that. Okay, guys, I'm gonna be checking out. Um, anything, Gauro? Anybody? Just has a minute, sir. Uh, or... One, there is a question. Uh -huh. uh, Madhuri Gogari. <laughs> So one question is that, uh, what are the substitute in the case of hormonal imbalance in menopausal women? What are the? Uh, substitute in the case of hormonal imbalance in menopausal women. What are the substitute? Yeah, in case of hormonal imbalance in menopausal women. <laughs> it's a... Uh... I, it's just not simple answer, so I cannot just say it. Um, probably ask her to email me. I can email her better. Um, it's a lot behind this. It's uh, hard to explain the science behind it and all that stuff. Um, what you can take is you got to talk to your doctor in terms of what to do with that. Um, but basically, it just uh, changes the elasticity of the muscle, and muscle are more ready to break down when uh, progesterone level changes. So that's why it's common. I've seen it in one after menopause to have the rotator cuff issues and all that stuff. Um, changing biomechanics posture would help somewhat, but putting some loads on the tendon at the right timing on top of doing all the hormone uh, treatment and all that would be the proper approach, but it's a lot detailed than that. So ask her to email me and then I can sure, write. I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rusi, sir, for your wonderful session. I'm just much thankful from the, on behalf of all Parul University Faculty of Physics, Arabic. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this wonderful session. Thank and uh, we have also, we are wishing uh, all the best to your future project. That is the feed zone and uh, three years. Uh, 360. Yeah, check it out, guys. Uh, it's a lot in there. Um, again, you will not be able to see unless if you log in, but uh, I will provide some demo on that after. It is useful for anybody. It's not only for institute, any individual. So suppose if I think that what is my fitness level, I can test myself in that and I can score my data and I can keep on checking it anytime I want and compare it as well. Plus, I forgot to mention that if you have a team, so suppose Gauro, if you're supposed to have a cricket team and if you want to compete with the team of Baroda and you want to know how fit your teams are, uh, you can do the testing for all the teams and it compares the data of each team member. So suppose Gauro has a better reach in certain direction than uh, somebody else or 
uh, Mr. X is the fastest runner out of all. So that way you can decide maybe what kind of uh, position to give to that uh, player as well. So it is very useful tool uh, to know your weakness and strength in the team as well, plus your progress. When you're working out, if you find that you cannot even jump and you have to do that, then you work on it and you compare it after, you compare with your past data. So that has very good comparison tool for your own progress as well as for your team member. So it's very, very handy regardless. Uh, it's just not because it's mine I'm saying. I have got this information from a bunch of other stuff I have dealt with in the past. That's why I created the whole thing. So, all right, guys. Okay, thank yeah. you, Steph. Thank you so much. No problem. Good, Good luck night. with everything. Hopefully everybody stay safe in this coronavirus area. And uh, we'll see you around. Take care, guys. Thank you, sir. No problem.